Welcome. I'm John Sace. As an economist, I make damage determination for cases and render my opinion in court. Because I am the economic witness, I usually take the stand near the end of the last day of trial. By this time, I see that many jurors have glazed over and have that deer in the headlights look. In the drama of the courtroom, I am one of many players working under the direction of the lead attorney. The jurors and the judge form the critical audience. In order to connect with them effectively, I learn about who they are, what they do for a living, and what general dynamics have emerged in the panel before I take the stand. The more organized and rehearsed the production, then the better I can do my job as the objective economic expert. For this reason, I have drawn on my own teaching and performing art experiences to humbly share my perceptions with attorneys. Hopefully, you can use these ideas to develop your own team when you go to trial. In this e-presentation, we discuss the adaptation of storytelling philosophies and methods used in screenwriting to the practice of trial law. Let's share some of the philosophy and methodology of this art in the hope that this knowledge will help the attorneys and others among us with trial preparation. Today, we will consider four elements that allows us to take what we learn from storytelling into the courtroom. And these include the use of the story arc, treating the jury as audience, combining discovery, deliberation, decision, and action to form insightful moments, and then using these to create the momentum to move the case from beginning to conclusion. Initially, my objective for learning the art of screenwriting was to enhance my production of economic videos as well as to lift my expert witness work to a higher level. However, I realized that I had much more to learn than I had anticipated about the practice of screenwriting. In short, screenwriting is 95% preparation and only 5% actual script writing. I discovered that I had set upon a path that not only would improve my own work, but also would provide valuable knowledge to share within the legal community. My favorite definition of drama, which may serve us well for trial practice, comes from filmmaker Alfred Hitchcock. Hitch used to say, Drama is life with the dull bits cut out. Be they matters of fact or fiction, drama is storytelling, using people, objects, and action in specific locations. The arts of connecting with a jury comprise many elements of storytelling. Number one, the story arc. The goal of a story and its characters is for them to follow the arc with its low points, build to a climax, and attain growth and development from beginning to end. This process of transformation is tantamount for any story told. Changes need to occur both in the story and with the main characters. If no such action occurs, the story lies as flat as a lizard asleep on a rock. As with any audience, jurors will tune out. Contrastingly, if both the story and the characters build upon a strong spine, they progress well along the arc. In the courtroom, this means that the backstory of the clients and witnesses need to be internalized in clarified detail by the lead storytellers. 
the attorneys. Jurors need to be provided with a convincing central character that is sent on a clearly defined journey. That central character needs to be someone to whom the jury can relate. Developing such characters usually requires stepping into his or her shoes and then doing more than a bit of research into their early formative influences. Only a minor portion of this preparatory work is heard by jurors in the narratives of the attorneys and the testimonies of witnesses. Nevertheless, this preparation surfaces from the subtext of attorneys and witnesses that leaves jurors with a clear, solid image of the speakers. Likewise, building the presentation of the case upon a strong spine provides jurors with a solid and consistent line to follow. This enables jury members to synthesize details. The spine will support their cognitive processes throughout the trial. Number two, the jury as audience. Some theorists argue that humans are hardwired in their response to prevalent story structures. In contrast, others argue that humans have learned these responses from immersion in the common media culture since primitive times. Either way, any person who has read a novel or has watched a play, feature-length film, or a television drama has hidden expectations about the effective development of plot and character. For example, the same basic story elements are found in the children's book, The Little Engine That Could, by Wattie Piper, as well as in the films Citizen Kane by Orson Welles and Django Unchained by Quentin Tarantino. These elements include exposition, inciting incident, first turning point, midpoint confrontation, second turning point, climax, resolution, and closure. Importantly, presenter cannot develop any of these elements without doing sound preparatory work. In essence, the purpose of effective storytelling in the courtroom is to connect and communicate with the judge and jury. The story itself contains a truth and tracks it through the pattern of human change through short segments. Even small and subtle changes constitute important elements as long as they matter deeply to the principal characters, the plaintiff or the defendant. The judge and jurors perceive these patterns of change, which are both external and internal to the person speaking. An inherent interweaving of surface action with deep action connects these external and internal patterns. However, if an emotionally distraught witness takes the stand, this fine fabric can unravel. In moments like these, the attorney needs to assume the role of spirit guide. She, he needs to clarify the dual layers of action in order to ensure that his, her witness connects and communicates effectively to others in the courtroom. A number of attorneys use mock courtrooms to practice with witnesses. Some law firms videotape their sessions for the purpose of analysis and coaching. At times, the deep action is the most difficult element to find and to identify correctly. However, this action resonates with the utmost importance for carrying the pattern of change along the character arc of the witness. Individually, deep actions form stepping stones 
were specific moments of change. These short and subtle moments create momentum in the argument of an attorney or in the testimony of a witness. Number three, D, 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 A, discovery, deliberation, decision, action. Though they are complex, momentum defining elements tend to be short. We can decompose these moments into a series of shorter elements. Discovery, deliberation, decision, and action. These elements are easier to show than to explain. A classic scene that illustrates this progression occurs at six minutes into the Charlie Chaplin film, City Lights, in which Charlie becomes smitten with a blind flower girl played by Virginia Cheryl. It is not until a specific action that Chaplin discovers that she's blind. She cannot see. In addition to studying film, we can obtain experiential understanding of these four elements through listening to natural dialogue between two persons. Within this simple chatter, we can find recurring patterns of discovery, deliberation, decision, and action. For example, at a restaurant, we might hear person A say, oh, they have a special on filet mignon today. That's the discovery. Person B responds, yum, that sounds good. Okay, that's the deliberation. I think I'll get that. And there's the decision. And finally, person A turns to the waiter and says, we'll have two of the steak specials. And that is the action. Many screenwriters and psychologists believe that the moment of decision is the most apparent because it emanates from our central control of the sum total of experiences, values, and worldviews. Of the four elements, the moment of discovery, the aha moment, proves to be the most elusive because it remains beyond our control. The second, deliberation, often takes only a split second to culminate before leading into the decision. Due to the overpowering magnitude and depth of this central control, we often make decisions emotionally. Then we justify them rationally. The higher our intelligence and education, the more sophisticated is our justification. By this theory, the actual decision comes from a preceding emotional impulse. It follows that decisions to take action are made by a character and that the nature of a character is made by his her decisions. However, a decision remains an unfulfilled intent until a person takes action. Some of us find this matter simple to identify. For example, if we decide to purchase a Gibson Les Paul guitar, the decision means little until the observable event of transaction occurs. Economically, we take action by receiving the guitar from the seller in exchange for either money or a product of equitable value. In the context of the moment, we define who we are by the action that we take. Number four, momentum. The building blocks for trial momentum include opening remarks to the jurors, the setup created by recounting the high points of the case, the direct, cross, and redirect questioning of witnesses, and the final summation to the jury. These are constructed out of brief moments of change. 
Moments of change create momentum in each of these longer segments. In using momentum creating moments, we strive to expedite delivery while remaining ethical. In the courtroom, any decision introduced to the judge and jury should make a significant difference to either of the two principal characters, the plaintiff and the defendant. Let us consider the main courtroom characters for a moment. Sometimes the opposing attorneys take the roles of protagonist and antagonist. In other cases, the principal clients fill these roles. In seemingly clear-cut cases, the plaintiff might assume the mantle of protagonist while the defendant is cast as the antagonist. In other cases, the plaintiff and the defendant alternate roles, depending on which version of the truth is being told. Each of them plays the antagonist to the protagonist of the other. On occasion, each role is shared by the attorneys and their respective clients. In matters of estates, the attorney may stand in for the deceased. However, the prime criteria are that the protagonist and antagonist are visible to the jury and that each appears in human persona. Whatever the situation, the decision that makes a significant difference to a character occurs at a precise moment of change. Whoever is speaking needs to underscore that precise moment clearly for the jury. The jurors need to understand why the plaintiff or defendant has made a certain decision. Furthermore, the jurors need to understand the difference that this decision has made to the character when the action took place. Proficient screenwriters advise us that the best way to accomplish this objective is to limit the revelation to five pages, which translates to five minutes for most of us pedestrians. In effect, we may want to use a short segment that includes a revealed discovery that precipitates a decision. Often, we present the decision to the jury after the revelation of the discovery. This information should be in the minds and hearts, as well as in the notes, of the main storyteller, the attorney. As we present information to jurors, they may hear the discovery, decision, and action in sequence. This depends upon the way that the two versions of the truth unfold in court. It is relatively simple to manage. However, the primary decisions and actions may have been revealed publicly before commencement of the trial. In such a case, the discovery unfolds during testimony in a way that supports one side or the other. We find a good five-minute example of the above twist in the climactic scene of Francis Ford Coppola's film adaptation of John Grisham's novel, The Rainmaker, about 20 minutes before the end of the film. In the backstory, the Great Benefits Insurance Company has been sued for a repeated denial of a claim filed for a young man who has died recently after developing leukemia. Before his death, medical experts stated that there was a 95% probability that a bone marrow transplant would have saved the young man's life. The insurance company argued that bone marrow transplants still are considered experimental and that its coverage excludes experimental procedures. The climactic scene begins with the CEO of Great Benefits taking the witness stand. As he waits to testify, an important development takes place. The plaintiff attorney finally succeeds in getting the Great Benefits Claim Manual admitted into evidence. The critical section of this document had been missing, or withheld, 
from the set of documents subpoenaed during discovery. The plaintiff attorney knows the details of this missing section because a copy, which had been stolen by a previous witness, came into his possession. In the first of a one-two-three punch, the jury learns that the insurance company not only has a policy of denying all claims within three days of submission, but that the manual outlines an intricate system of routing, shuffling, and rerouting. This system keeps claims in denial until most policyholders finally give up. In the second punch, the jurors learn that out of 98,000 policyholders, more than 11,000 had filed claims. Of these claims, more than 9,000, 80%, were denied to conclusion. In the knockout blow, members of the jury discover important information from the CEO, who is reading from an internal report issued by an advisory committee that he heads. His committee stated that bone marrow transplants are standard procedure. Also, the insurance company would be financially justified to invest in bone marrow clinics. At this point, the case for the defense unravels and the jury finds in favor of the plaintiff. In this scene, we hear subsequent discoveries that build neatly upon the previous ones. From earlier testimony, the jurors know that the claim for the estate of the plaintiff had been denied as a matter of policy, in other words, an action by the defendant. The second discovery confirms the first one with the introduction of now admissible evidence. This further supports the accusation of routine claim denial. However, through the reading of the committee report, the jurors discover that the claim denial decision and action have been predicated upon erroneous information known only to the defendant at the time of denial. This scene provides us with a resounding example of a courtroom-based drama. Author John Grisham was a practicing attorney as he was becoming a successful novelist. This led to his creation of realistic, well-constructed scenes such as the one above, which successfully presents a complex structure of discovery, deliberation, decision, and action in an accessible and entertaining five-minute scene. In conclusion, let's review what we've looked at. The story arc, which is our underlying structure, the jury as audience, who are we speaking to? Discovery, deliberation, decision, action that form the moments that then help to carry us through the momentum of the case. I hope that you enjoyed this and I am working on at least one follow-up to this, and I hope that uh, if you enjoyed this one, I'll let you know when the next one is ready, and uh, please come back and view that one. Thank you.